Hi, I'm Kent Rochester, farming here with my wife Michelle and two boys, Kobe and Thomas, and on the family farm that was settled by my grandpa in 1956. In many peaks, just north and east of Albany, and probably 13 or 14 k's from the coast. Normally, we, we, well, we've been anywhere from average of 750, 700 mils of rain to a metre of rain not long ago, and then this year we're back probably sub 500 mils. And, I think it's our driest on record ever and been quite a challenging 24. We had a really good but really short growing season, so a really late start and a really early finish, which was a proper test. Our farm's about 1,300 hectares. We've still got some forestry and quite a bit of remnant bush, so we're about 800 hectares of grass. At the moment we have about 1,100 here. I'd, I'd love that to be 800, we're probably overdone and we range from anywhere from there to probably two and a half thousand is about where I, I think we top out in the spring where I'd be happy with about three steers to the hectare is probably the top for us. Did 3,000 bodies last year. We're sitting around somewhere a bit past 600 kilos of beef per hectare per year. We one day I'd love to hit a tonne, but we'll battle away and that's our goal to try and increase those limits. Predominantly running Angus cattle. We track everything from induction right through to MSA and we're finding them more dependable and more reliable. There's less variation and we can get a more consistent product at the end. The soil type of our farms predominantly sandy loam over clay or gravel and we grow as much diverse pasture as we can, predominantly ryegrass clover but with cereals and brassicas and a bunch of other stuff wherever we can fit it. Our pastures and how we sow them, I've been really lucky with the, through our contracting business being able to see lots of farms and do lots of pasture establishment stuff around the district. We see what's new and see what's working and what's not and are able to bring some of that home and blend it all together and, and come up with our own stuff. The history of the farm is settled in 56 with Grandpa and Grandpa and Dad then farmed it through till the 90s and then they planted the whole place to bluegums and 2005 Michelle and I bought the farm as a bluegum farm and then as the bluegums collapsed we started renovating it, putting it back to pasture. Enterprise has pretty much changed over the last few years. We were running some breeding cattle. We went out of sheep in 2018 and all cattle since then. We've changed over to a full grass finishing system. So we're buying in heavy weaners and, and yearling cattle and, and running them through to finish on, on grass on a year round basis. Last year we finished just over 3,000 bodies. We moved over from breeding to grass finishing mainly because I'm sort of on this quest to be really efficient with our grass. We have two main markets. Our main one, I guess, is, is dirty clean food that we supply most of our cattle to. They do 45 a week into there and we're now the sole supplier for that job and we're really lucky to be in the Coles Grays grass-fed program that we supply basically every second week. A driver of getting more beef per hectare or more kilos of beef per hectare. Just about trying to still be profitable and try to make our farm successful. It's, it's pretty tough and the margins are really tight. And trying to be more productive without spending more on bigger inputs or alongside those inputs, getting the most out of it we can is what's going to keep us here. I think our systems changed. I never really set out to be regenerative or I never really just decided that's what we're going to do. In, in 2018, we had one of these really tough autumns and we changed everything up, all our systems, mainly based around our grazing system and our intensive rotational graze. And our approach to rotational grazing is forever changing. So really around duration in paddock, how much we're going to leave and density of grazing and time of grazing is always growing. We've gone to super high density, we've gone to super frequent shifts. Not a one size fits all, it's taking us a while to figure out where that groove sits. 
Finishing beef year round on grass is really challenging. It's really easy for a small period of time through the springtime. And here we are now with a big feed bill and a big feed budget to deal with, and it's really quite tough, but that's what makes it fun and makes it exciting and, and a challenge and keeps you trying to do better. As a grass-fed producer, obviously we can't use cereal grains or we don't use cereal grains in our ration. We try to basically take our spring surplus, our silage stack, and extend it as far as we can. So adding hay and straw, faba beans and a grass-based pellet, we're getting better and better at blending that mix to one, make it cost-effective, and two, get the best gains out of the animals we can. That's a, an ongoing process that we're trying to get better at. We're using the Simple app really to develop our rations and then we really ground truth them with the OptiWay and adjust from there. So rather than setting up a ration to suit certain megs of energy and get, we set up for where we think we are, see what the cows are doing and then come back and trim it up or grow it to achieve our goals from there. accident in 2001 and was working in a vineyard on a grape harvester and fell off a conveyor belt, got my boots caught up in the conveyor and landed on my, on my head and that's where I've finished up. The diagnosis from my injury was that I broke my neck at C6 and obviously was never going to walk again and that didn't have any feeling from about my collarbone down. I could feel about half my arms and my hands work okay but not, not so much my fingers. I was really lucky to get my wrists back for a while there they were pretty floppy and that was a big step and that's meant that I'm able to drive. At the time obviously it was a huge thing and it was really tough to, to get around. I spent six months in hospital in Perth and that was a really really hard time and then and the next few years after that were were still really tough and until uh, till we found our feet and were able to rebuild and got married to Michelle and then moved on towards kids and, and the farm growing and now we're in a, in a really good place, you know, we're doing cool things and doing what everyone else does, just slightly different. Family's hugely important, helping me with the farm, especially Michelle and how she helps me with everything, getting into the car and getting out at the end of the day. Kids are great, gives us a release from just work and chasing them around and keeping them busy is, is, is awesome. Being a chair's changed the way I farm a lot, I, I guess, and I think there's some real positives out of it. I don't spend time straining up a wire or doing a lot of kettle work, but I do have time to think about things and analyse what's going on and bark orders and make things happen that other guys don't have time to sit back and see from the outside. I live in my ute and I had to spend about a month, I reckon, just daydreaming how on earth I was going to make a dual cab ute work. I've done over a million k's since my accident, I guess, and 10,000 hours in tractors and different machines, and yeah, figuring some of that out took some doing. My accident definitely has changed the way I am entirely. Ag Tech helped me in my job. I can take control of grazing. I can take control of the numbers around the farm that I would otherwise have to hand out to someone else. I think the fact that I'm farming from a chair has had a fair bit to do with ag tech but I'd also coming out of blue gums the, the farm's a complete blank slate so the fencing plans, water plans, grazing plans, all that are there's no pre-set paddock plan or anything like that and that's what first got me looking into virtual fencing is that the last big parcel of blue gums we took out I never intended to fence, it was always supposed to be virtual fence. We set up a, a really solid perimeter boundary fence and that was all we were going to do, but it's taken a few more years for it to actually come about, but here we are now. We've implemented quite a bit of technology from electric fence stuff to the big ones, I suppose, are OptiWave, a couple of OptiWave systems on farm and, and just recently, of course, virtual fencing has become a part of things. We implemented EID onto the farm. Towards the end, we started playing with it with the last of our sheep, and then sheep left, and it was just something we did with the cows, just to track what we were doing and, and how they were performing, and it's basically nearly a requirement of things, so that was the way that evolved, and we just use it more and more, I guess, to, to track and follow what's going on. 
tracking where the animals have come from, how they perform and whether we should buy those again or not or how they're going to grade as an MSA body and trying to keep in the top end of that as much as we can and it just helps us to know what works and what doesn't. OptiWay came to the farm next after our change to, of grazing really and alongside EID and weighing when we'd bring things back to the yard and find that they hadn't done what we thought they'd do and we always make up an excuse. We needed to find out why it was that that wasn't working. The OptiWay system that sits in the paddock, it's a front foot way system where they go into some attractant, it reads their EID tag, tells them who they are, front foot weighs them, generates a live weight from there and then tells us whether they're gaining weight, losing weight or whatever the case may be. Virtual fencing is new to us in 2024 in June when they changed things around and we, we no longer needed a, a base station to have a go which made it way more affordable to have a trial. We bought 50 neck bands just to see how they'd go and how the cattle would behave behind them and it was yeah awesome. You draw a virtual fence on, on my iPad in my case and when the cows approach that boundary it gives them a, an audio tone and a beep and if they don't understand the beep then they get a pulse and they turn around and realise that's where the boundary is. We started with 50 colours, we've now got 300, I think there's probably another 100 on the way. We'll continue to roll that out. We won't put completely farm wide, but we'll try and get as many as we can on as we can afford it. We've found that if most of the mob have got collars on, and in fact we've a couple of mobs today that we've seen, a couple of them are missing one, or one's fallen off or, or whatever, they still stay really tight with the group, and we're happy to have the odd one there that's not in under collar. The cost of the neck bands is $350 each and then there's a, a monthly subscription fee as well of a couple of dollars. So it's a big investment, especially to, to get three, five hundred collars is, is a big step and really happy with those first 50. They did amazing things in the first month and although we had a really short growing season in 24, there was a period there where we were we were growing a lot of a lot of beef. We were out to sort of 240 kilos per hectare per month, which is huge for us and really let us know that there's potential to push way further than we'd been before. In my brain, the figure we needed them to last seven years and there's obviously a labour saving for shifting cattle and then there's the productivity gain and so far it's looking really good. I'd like to think that they'd be paid for in three or four years but maybe I'm being a bit optimistic. Looking really good so far but we've got a long way to go. welfare side of the collars was my huge driver for the first 50 that we bought and we were really worried, especially my wife was more worried than I was and that was a big thing that we set out to find out how they'd deal with it. I thought I'd be looking at how their adverse reaction to it would be and instead of that we found a, a positive reaction and I think, not that I'm brilliant, but reading cattle seeing cattle that are doing two and a half kilos a day on grass and walking up to you and licking the mirrors and looking really relaxed and really happy reassured us that they were doing way better than, than I ever imagined. Drawing paddocks is quite simple, just got to get your head around a little bit how to shift them and what to do and leaving enough space around water points and things like that which is all just a change of mind set and a change of thinking from physical fences. Setup of virtual fencing varies quite a bit through the season, so during the growing season and when we're actively grazing a rotation we'll be way more intense and focus on way different objectives than today. Right now we'll be focused on just being able to leave gates open and not cows get away and drive in and out feeding without opening gates and focusing nutrition onto parts of the paddock that we really need to deliver. Yeah, it's way different in winter when we're really intensively trying to make the most of every blade of grass. The long term plan definitely has most of the farm with its neck bands on and crazy as it sounds we may start to remove some of the fencing we've already set up or I've set the whole farm up for a grazing platform where we may start to transition over to, to full virtual fence. 
the three main bits of AgTech work really well together in the fact that we can get feedback with how often we're moving the cattle and what that's doing to them in real time in terms of weight gain really is the main driver. So we know that if we move them, leave them there too long, they're going to pull back in weight gain. If we move them too fast, we're wasting grass. So maximising what we can get out of that paddock and turning it into beef, it's really cool to be able to use those things and mesh it all together and get what we're after. Twenty four played out really weird. It was a, a long, dry autumn that was getting really tough and we were really late to get going. Then we had a, a really good short growing period through the winter that we were able to make the most of. I think that's one of our farm goals is to be rain ready and when conditions are right make the most of it that we possibly can. And then of course we had a pretty sh shut off spring that shut off on us pretty early and turned out pretty tough but we got we got through it okay we're in better place than we were last year this time. I think every one of these tough seasons teaches us more lessons than the easy ones so we've learnt way more from last year than probably the three years before that. Practical lessons we've learned out of those dry periods is really I spent a lot of time too much time feeding for maintenance and unless we're feeding for growth and growing kilos of beef, we can't pay those bills. We're looking at new ag tech and, and what we look at, whether we're going to implement it or not, is I'm really curious and I like playing, so that helps me make decisions that maybe I shouldn't even, but mainly it's around that, is it going to help me with being more efficient with grass or being more efficient with labour or being more efficient in general and or make things faster or, or just plain easier. The challenges with the technology, I think it's just learning the systems and getting things worked out and ironing out a few glitches that, especially as an early adopter with things, is always a few things that come up from the start. Some advice for other producers that want to adopt certain things, I think it's definitely just to start off small, see if it fits your system, see if it's something that works for your farm. Everyone's different and everyone does things differently and, and then grow from there. Business goals, I think, for now are to really consolidate on these tough years and get back on top of a few things and really start to set up over the next five for whether the my boys want to take this over or not and whether we aim to really grow to set them something up for them to take over or whether we get to a point and start to slow down a bit, I guess. So yeah, want to push really hard for the next few years and see what we can achieve and then go from there. One of the plans now is to continue to roll out our virtual fencing and really push these kilos to the hectare of beef that we're growing and really intensify our grazing and see where that leads. Work on our pastures a little bit harder and just really try and grow on what we've started and see how it pans out. The future of AgTech looks really interesting and there's still plenty more that we can do. I think with satellite pasture readings and reading residuals, maybe in my eyes I think that it won't be that far away before the satellite reads the pasture, talks to the collar, you plug in a residual that you want to move at and it will nearly move the cattle for you and maybe we'll get to a point where the virtual fencing will be able to measure weight gain and body condition and draft cattle off and you just come and bring another lot back to the yard. There's, there's quite a bit of space left there where we can maximise what we can do with all this stuff and potentially grow a heap more beef. Seem to find an awful lot on the internet and just talking to other producers and producer days and MLA stuff has been really good to get amongst other people and find out little tips and bits and pieces that help us out. So yeah, did the PGS grazing matcher not long ago, a couple of years ago, and really enjoyed that, and that's part of our grazing strategy and, and getting the most out of our grass. Anyone else thinking about investing in those sort of things, just start small and have a try and see whether it fits your system or not, and work from there.